I want to thank you for attending this webinar and uh, for your interest in learning about uh, these journals and uh, about publishing uh, in general. As uh, uh, Professor Cunningham said, my name is uh, Marta Anton and uh, I'm the editor of the Modern Language Journal. Um, this is my editorial um, Tim uh, Sean Lowen is the associate editor. Martha Bigelow is the editor for the uh, Perspectives column that is published in the summer. Uh, the issue is just about to come out and the focus this year is um, on indigenous languages uh, reclamation. Uh, Wanda Lowy, monograph editor. Kate Miller, our associate copy editor. And Ryan Sandin, my editorial assistant. Um, when you're thinking about submitting a manuscript to a journal, the first uh, thing you need to have into account is the scope and mission of the journal. In uh, the case of MLJ, uh, we published the scholarly exchange among researchers and teachers of all modern foreign languages, including English as a second language. Um, this, so any language, um, studies on any language are welcome, but because there are uh, some journals that focus specifically on English, we're especially interested in uh, studies on languages other than English. We typically publish, um, I would say, about 50-50 in studies about English and then studies about other languages, but that's a, a criteria um, of priority for us. Um, we are a generalist journal, so uh, we are interested in any study that has to do with uh, language teaching and learning, regardless the methodological orientation. We publish quantitative, qualitative, mixed methods, uh, some research synthesis and meta-analysis. Um, we recently added a new type of article, which is the critical review essay, but so far those are by invitation only, not open submission. Um, so for open submission, we emphasize uh, empirical research. Um, two uh, criteria of importance for us um, are that uh, the studies must support uh, clear and important implications and applications to language uh, learning and teaching. Um, and also that they have to have a high um, standard of scholarly excellence in terms of uh, methodological uh, rigor and uh, theoretical implications. So those two, I would say, are uh, the particular niche for the uh, Modern Language Journal. We publish uh, four regular um, issues and also a special issue in January. Um, we welcome proposals for guest edited issues or monographs and typically publish two special issues per year. As I mentioned before, Perspectives appears in the summer issue and the uh, contributions are invited. Um, we receive over 400 submissions per year uh, right now, and our acceptance rate, rate has been pretty consistently around 12%. Um, in the latest information on impact factor, our uh, 2018 impact factor was 3.7, and we're ranked uh, fourth in linguistics journals and seventh in education and educational uh, research. Um, this page um, includes authors' guidelines, and I would recommend when you're thinking about uh, submitting an article that you start checking the authors' guidelines for any journal that you might want to choose. Uh, these are important uh, recommendations and you will find very useful information about how to select the journal that is the best fit for your research, um, what are the expectations for methodological rigor, um, what are the manuscript submission guidelines, uh, transparency in research, etc. I've chosen these four areas to uh, mention um, one is uh, talking about, again, criteria for preferred manuscripts. I uh, mentioned uh, our, well, 
journals in general view on um, how we detect plagiarism, uh, transparency and dissemination of research, and then a few words about conducting research now in the time of uh, COVID-19. Um, so when we look at our uh, submissions in 2018, uh, diversity really is the norm. You can see we had almost 300 distinct keywords and uh, we publish on all of these topics as long as uh, it's related to language teaching and learning, we're interested in it. This is uh, kind of in order of frequency um, and something to have into account is that you don't necessarily need to publish on the topics that are uh, most studied. Um, in fact, if you can come up with a study that it uh, explores an area that uh, has not received much attention and has uh, important contributions, that has a very good chance um, of being published. Um, as I mentioned before, the uh, methodological orientation of the articles we publish is uh, it's very wide, um, and here are some, uh, again, in kind of order of frequency, uh, the, the most common approaches in English is uh, still by far uh, the highest number of submissions for us. Um, here I put some of the, um, what the field is calling for, and this comes from what uh, the leading scholars in our fields are saying that we need. We need uh, very large data studies, we need uh, truly longitudinal studies, uh, focus on multilingualism uh, rather than just bilingualism, uh, mixed method studies, collaboration, uh, multi-site uh, research, uh, replication, and Emma will talk a little more about that. Uh, context diversity, we know uh, quite a bit about certain populations of learners and certain uh, instructional contexts and learning contexts, not so much about others. Um, and so we need to expand um, our, our reach there. Uh, individual factors and assessment uh, of policy, curriculum, and program outcomes are also uh, very much needed. Um, most journals today have some sort of uh, so software plagiarism check. We use Authenticate and um, it will, uh, every article that is going to be sent out for peer review is subjected to this check. And uh, the check will yield a similarity index that then we look at very closely. Some journals have a specific percentage number uh, whereby an article, a submission that meets, uh, that surpasses that percentage is automatically re rejected. We look very closely at the report, but uh, the recommendation here is that you need to be very careful to acknowledge um, the work of others and your previous work in your submission. And you also need to uh, explain very clearly in your manuscript how the work that you're submitting advances uh, the work that has been published previously by you or by others. Um, we also support uh, transparency in research initiatives and we award uh, open science badges if uh, you are willing, this is for accepted articles, if you're willing to uh, share your data or your uh, instruments for data collection in uh, an open science repository. IRIS is by far the preferred repository for um, our authors. And again, Emma, who leads these initiatives, will talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also require our um, authors um, to submit a one-page accessible summary uh, following a template and the uh, purpose is to disseminate research um, to teachers and others who may not be expert in the particular area of the study, but uh, who's, uh, who might be interested in this research. The uh, 
Summaries uh, need to be written in very plain, accessible language. Uh, a template is followed, and then these summaries are accessible in the uh, OASIS website, but they're also published in the online version of the article. This is a list of journals that either require or recommend authors to submit um, a summary. Um, COVID-19 has uh, placed uh, some constraints to uh, conducting research. Uh, it's been for us here uh, where I am in Indianapolis, it's been three months of social distancing. And uh, so even though it has not affected greatly the publishing industry per se, it is obviously affecting your ability to conduct research. Uh, researchers are being very creative in adapting um, to this particular time. Um, it is a good time period to finish those studies for which you already have data or to think about your theoretical framework and design and focus for future studies. Um, for ongoing studies, you may find that you need to adapt your research questions and modify them to what's possible to do at this point. But I also see that it's uh, providing opportunities for research. Um, in uh, my particular area for Modern Language Journal, the massive shift that we've had to online uh, language learning and teaching, um, I think will surely uh, yield some interesting studies about the um, you know, training teachers, the effects on language learning from these changes, et cetera. Um, it also opens opportunities for global collaboration. I think we have been finding that the technology is there in many places to support the continuation of our work. Um, I know that uh, some researchers are finding that uh, uh, with the push to use technology, they're able to uh, recruit participants uh, globally, whereas before they may have looked more locally. So I think it's a time for creativity and uh, some good research uh, surely will come out of that and I'll be looking forward to, uh, to uh, reading those submissions. Um, finally, here are some of the reasons why uh, we might reject a manuscript. The main reason is when the study does not fit the scope of the journal. So again, going back to that first step of uh, selecting the journal that is the best fit for the particular area that you're studying. Um, if there is significant overlap with existing work or just plain plagiarism, that might be a problem as well. Um, issues with uh, methodological rigor, if the design is not appropriate, it will get rejected. Similarly, if it's not clearly connected and uh, to a theoretical approach and advancing theory, uh, that, that is a problem as well. Um, if the interpretation of results is too preliminary or speculative, it would not be appropriate for us. So we uh, rarely uh, publish pilot studies, although um, it depends, again, on the significance of the contribution. Again, if the findings are not original or highly significant, this does not mean that the statistics need to be significant. It means that the findings overall need to be significant. And uh, keep in mind that for journals that receive the high volume of submissions um, that we do, Sometimes uh, a study is appropriate, but it still gets rejected because we need to select. Uh, we have a limit on how many articles we can publish. So that, that um, criteria of uh, original contribution, uh, advancing theory is particularly important. Um, for us, uh, the implications for teaching uh, if there are no implications or they're not strong, then it's not a good fit for us. Um, and finally, writing might be a problem, although I must say that we get uh, many submissions from uh, authors uh, for who 
English is not their first language, and we tend to work with them. English is not my first language either. So uh, writing alone would not be a sufficient reason to reject an article. Finally, uh, we often get the question, can I resubmit my ma manuscript if it's rejected? We have that information on the website and technically the answer is yes, but in practical terms, um, if you're not encouraged by the editor or the reviewers to make revisions um, and resubmit, um, it most likely means that in the estimation of the editors of those reviewers the the sign is such that it's not a matter of revising you really need to redo the study and i do recommend that you take advantage of the um, often very rich feedback that you receive by excellent reviewers look at it carefully and um, be thankful for the time that those experts put into reading your article and take it to your advantage in order to revise. And um, I think that's it for me. I wasn't keeping track of the time. I hope I didn't go too far beyond 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anton. We were um, pleased to hear your, your insights. Um, so I now have a general announcement to make to our audience members. And um, it appears that when sharing the host privileges with our panelists, I no longer have access to the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask that um, everyone who has a question to just please email me your questions. And that way I'll be able to access them um, while the other speakers are, 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 um, are speaking. So if you've submitted a question via the chat already, I apologize, please resubmit that. You've seen my email address is now uh, in the chat, joe.cunningham at georgetown.edu. And I'll be happy to receive your questions that way. So um, let's now please transition to our next speaker. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Emma Marsden uh, to take the floor. Um, and I will now pass over the hosting privileges. Hey, thank you very much for this invitation and uh, thank you all for your interest in getting published. Some of my messages will be similar to Marta's, reinforcing some of the things that she's been saying. So a brief introduction to the journal. So the general editor of the Language Learning Research Club is Lourdes Ortega and you'll see in a minute why we have this general editor structure. I am the journal editor who is responsible for the four regular issues that are that come out every year for language learning. And the associate editors that support me in selecting articles, sending them out to review are Cara Morgan Short, Judith Cormos, uh, Scott Crossley, um, from se 1st of September in 2020, um, Therese Grutto, we're very pleased to welcome her, and Guillaume Thierry um, is the editor of the Cognitive Neuroscience series. The journal was founded in 1948 and is also published by Wiley, just as um, Modern Language Journal is. There's, as I mentioned, there are four regular issues every year, one special issue, um, which is from an open call and um, every other year we have a cognitive neuroscience volume and that has just gone live on our site actually this year's um, issue. The topics um, are we have to be obviously related to language and learning and I intentionally emphasize the and so um, to see this the other way around studies that are just about language or just about learning and don't emphasize enough of the language are usually beyond the scope of the journal. 
So um, topics broadly related to language plus learning. And that, just as Marta was saying, is very uh, broadly interpreted. So we have a very wide scope. We are um, theoretically um, and methodologically very open to all sorts of different orientations. So I thought I'd just start with a very brief um, walkthrough of what happens in the peer review process. And I think this is fairly typical for most journals. First of all, the, the articles are um, seen, screened by the journal editor, by me. And um, if they're deemed to be within scope and of sufficient, uh, sufficiently rigorous, then they are reviewed by an associate editor. So I pass them on to one of those associate editors and uh, including, I act as, a, as an associate editor too. And then we have a more careful look at the article and more often than not, at that stage, the articles get sent out to external review. And they're sent out to usually three reviewers, um, occasionally four, and, very, and occasionally when we cannot get that third reviewer to submit their review, occasionally we have to make a decision based on two, but usually it's three reviewers. And uh, at this point, I'd like to say a, an enormous thank you to the reviewers because they do um, uh, so much good work and as Marta finished off by saying they offer tremendously useful advice it can be painful at the time but try and see it as a as a learning experience as, as much as possible um, they they provide very detailed reviews and they recommend to the journal editor whether to reject the manuscript give um, suggest that the author conduct major revisions minor revisions or accept the paper I don't think I've yet experienced a straight accept on the first on the first submission, maybe once, um, but it's extremely rare. So be prepared for minor, major or reject. Um, so there are revisions and these range from a total rewrite sometimes, um, reanalyzing your data, very occasionally collecting more data, but usually that would mean a, a reject decision down to very small typographical errors and, and getting your references straight, presenting your tables right, presenting your statistics right. And then there's usually one or two or sometimes three more rounds of external review and revisions. And then hopefully you'll get an accept decision and sometimes a reject. Um, now, sometimes that means that um, with further amendments, you might be able to submit this to another journal. Another journal might have different ideas about um, what they want to publish, but that reject decision will also inform your plans for your next study, your future research agenda. And there is evidence as well, I have the link somewhere on this slide, that if you are rejected, apparently this increases the citations of your work. Um, I guess because it goes through the system and more people view it. Okay, so where to submit? This is the big decision. So I've tried to construct, um, structure this um, along th uh, six uh, things to consider. So first of all, as Marta said, know your journal really well. Read the information on the journal website. Read it really carefully, uh, the scope of the journal and the requirements for the submission. And have a, get a feel for the, the articles that that journal does publish. Um, do they tend to have a very strong theoretical focus? Do they tend to have a very strong practical focus? Is there a balance between those? And does your reporting achieve the detail and the rigor of recent articles that have been published? Now our standards are changing all the time. A few years ago, we didn't really expect effect sizes. Now we always expect effect sizes. So try and look at some recent articles to um, check about the level of reporting and the, the methodological rigor that you'd be expected to um, uh, describe in your, in your article. And also, are your topic and methods at least a little similar to other articles that that, pub that journal publishes? Now, the question here is, is it an agenda that the journal is likely to continue to support? And one clue to this, this is not, um, this is not a hard and fast rule, but one clue might be 
do you cite articles that that journal has published? Now it's not a hard and fast rule because of course we publish articles that don't cite anything, but it is some indication that they're, that you're that you that you're hitting an agenda that 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 journal is interested in publishing on. Um, now, as I've mentioned, language learning to get published in language learning, your study has to be about language and learning. And um, but however, we have a very wide scope and we do not invite contributions. These are open submissions. And so we are always searching for those hidden gems. So this is to temper that previous statement that, you know, does your article cite things that have, have been published by that journal? But also, if it doesn't, it might come from left field. It might be a hidden gem that's still well within scope. Um, OK, second thing to consider, what kind of articles does the journal publish? These are listed on our website. Uh, to summarise here, empirical studies, these are standalone articles that collect primary uh, data. And this includes replications. And I would encourage you to, if you do conduct a replication, don't hide that, don't bury it, uh, label it as such in the, in the title and the abstract. Uh, conceptual review articles, um, methodological review articles, um, a new article type that we started from the 1st of March, which um, is open to submissions now, is known as the methods showcase article. So that introduces new or emerging methods, techniques or instrumentation. The aim is to describe the methods, but also provide really detailed examples of their application, including working through a, a worked example of analysing the data, for example. And then systematic review articles, which include meta-analyses and registered reports. I'm going to talk a little, uh, quite a bit more about registered reports in a few slides, so I'll, I'll save that. The third thing to consider is that you might be interested in practicalities about the publication rates and turnaround times and certainly in the UK we have to um, um, demonstrate our research at particular times in a five-year cycle so um, it, you might be interested in the rate. So first of all the acceptance rate um, is very similar to modern language journals, um, it's about a 13% acceptance rate for the 14 regular issues. Um, and the speed of the process, um, there's an average of about five days from when an article comes in to being either desk rejected or progressing on to the next stage where your, your manuscript is considered by an associate editor. Um, it's about 10 months, this is a very wide range, but an average of 10 months from the first submission to an accept decision. But that can range between, well, I saw one on one month, and sort of the, the upper interquartile range is about 15 months. So finally, once you've been accepted, how long does it take to see your work online? And it's an average of about two and a half months, which can range from a few weeks to three months. Okay, the fourth thing to consider, but uh, we need to take this with a pinch of salt or a bucket of salt, um, are the metrics. So there are various different ways that journals are measured, their impact is measured and uh, for example according to you've, you can choose your metrics of course um, according to Google Scholar language learning ranks as you can see here. According to the ISI citation reports um, these reports calculate how many times an article published in the last two years or the last five years gets cited by others. So an impact factor of two is that on average it gets cited twice um, and it, the five year impact factor takes into account more history in that, in that journal. And then a new metric is um, given the interest of the open science movement and um, the Centre for Open Science is now um, annually um, awarding transparency and openness points and uh, recently language learning scored um, 11 on this metric and that's the same score that was given to PLOS One and Nature. Okay the fifth thing to consider um, is um, sort of taking a long view and, and how, how do you want to see yourself as a researcher and contributing to this the big picture by engaging in open science practices. So you might want to check out whether the journal actively supports open science. Marta's already talked a little bit about this. 
Um, so open science practices are known to help um, the research quality, um, its usefulness, the, our ability to scrutinise research and its visibility, its impact. Um, and we talk about open science practices, we can group these into open materials, having your materials openly available for others, having your data openly available and pre-registering your study. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and uh, in, in view of this activity, this movement, this open, um, this aim to be transparent with our research practices, on the 1st of January this year, language learning started to require authors to submit their materials with the article. So by materials, I mean the instruments used to collect the data. Um, some articles obviously do not have any materials. Um, conceptual review articles don't have any materials, but um, if you've used a questionnaire, if you've used a language test, if you've used a grammaticality judgment test, those kinds of things. And then, um, I also wanted to flag the OASIS initiative, the three Wiley journals, um, Language Learning, TESOL Quarterly and um, the MLJ and recently Language Teaching Research has just joined, um, regularly um, require their authors to write an accessible summary, which as Marta explained, goes into the article itself online and is also posted at OASIS on the, in the repository. Oasis now has um, uh, several hundred, I think we're on about five, six hundred uh, summaries now. We've got um, thousands of downloads, so teachers and educators are, are using those summaries. Um, a little bit more on promoting open science practices that I mentioned. Marta's already mentioned these badges, so-called badges that um, journals award, and it's just a way as a as a researcher who wants to publish in a journal that you can see that these journals are supporting authors and acknowledging that they've made their work um, transparent and available for the community to use and see. Um, so uh, if you make your materials, there's different places you can um, post it or hold it. And IRIS is um, uh, the, the most well used, I suppose, in our field in the area of applied linguistics. And you can see there some statistics about how, how this repository is growing and used. Um, also holding your data, IRIS holds um, research data now, and there are other places where people post their data. And then finally, um, a pre-registered um, kite mark um, where you can pre-register your study. I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So pre-registration is where you publicly register the planned design, the methods, the data cleaning, your analysis. You can do that at the Open Science Framework. And then your pre-registration gets stamped, date, date, um, time stamped before you go and collect your data. Now, one reason for doing this is to reduce um, temptations to commit what is what have become known as questionable research practices. So things like changing your design halfway, if, if you're doing a confirmatory design, um, you're doing hypothesis testing, then really we shouldn't change our design halfway through, uh, tweaking your analysis or not reporting or finding. So by pre-registering your study, it's a way of saying, look, I've, I've, I've done what I said I would do and I didn't change it halfway through. Now, um, so there's a little metaphor for this, researchers tying themselves to a mast so that they don't get tempted to um, change their designs. Now, pre-registration is all very well, but um, it can't reduce what um, many early career researchers, all researchers are concerned about, which is bias, publication bias and reviewer bias. So this is where registered reports come in. Now, registered report is a peer review and um, in principle acceptance before you collect your data. Um, so here's the basic idea, um, starting from the left there, you develop your idea and you design your study. And at that point, after you've designed and you've written up your proposal, you um, submit your stage one manuscripts and that's sent out to peer review. Um, and just as with normal manuscripts, that can be one, two, three rounds of review. And the field helps you to design a, a really rigorous, robust study and helps to make sure that you've designed something that can answer your research question. If it's approved, then it's given in principle acceptance. And at that point, the journal cannot, if you stick to your plan, if you do what you said you would do, the journal cannot then say, 
uh, no matter what the reviewers say, the journal cannot say, well, we're not going to publish it because you didn't find something statistically significant. So it kind of locks journals into committing to publish something. Um, and the reviewers then, so then you go off, you collect your data, you write your report, you analyze it according to the analysis that you said you would do. And then you have another peer review and that is faster because of course you've, you've done what you said you would do and, and there's not a great deal that reviewers can comment on at that time other than they did what they said they would do. Okay, uh, so you can embargo your in principally accepted manuscript by on the on the OSF. You can you can hide it essentially. Okay, so just to summarise what registered reports do, you write your literature review, you do your methods, your analysis. It, the aim is to reduce bias, and I want to emphasise as well that you do have some flexibility still. You can still do exploratory analyses you still can report serendipitous findings it doesn't lock you in to the exclusion of everything else but you just clearly flag those in your manuscript oh, and this is something else i did that i hadn't registered before so there's an editorial that where you can find more information about that um, so i thought that the um as well as marta's very um well articulated um points about research during covid19 um, registered reports is something that might well be particularly suited to times when collecting data is difficult. Um, so you can plan the study, um, you can think about your theoretical framework, you can think about your instrumentation and submit a stage one manuscript and then um, hopefully when um, things become easier you'll be able to collect the data or indeed collecting data online is becoming more, more uh, commonly talked about and done. And uh, registered reports are particularly good for replications and we need replications in the field. There have been many, many calls, 51 calls for replication. And well, a couple of years ago, there was only 67. That's gone up a bit since then. So registered reports are, are good for replication research. And I think that's it. Those are the six things that I, I thought were worth raising. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marsden. And we are now going to turn to our last panelist, uh, Dr. Graham Porter, and I am going to pass the hosting privileges uh, to him. Okay, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I apologize, first of all, for the massive microphone you can see at my side. This, my daughter's a singer and I've stolen her studio down here for the afternoon um, and she doesn't know about it so hopefully she won't come in. Um, my name is uh, Graham Port. I am the uh, editor of the Cambridge University Press Journal uh, Language Teaching um, which has been going for about 60 years as well. Uh, don't be fooled by the title language teaching. Uh, we're not much to do with teaching but we're everything to do with what feeds into teaching. Um, which basically means we're very interested in all applied linguistics and uh, second language acquisition uh, topics. Um, I'm also the, uh, the founder and the manager of a uh, journal editors forum, which I'll talk more about uh, in a minute when you see the, uh, uh, the slideshow in a, a couple of minutes. Uh, it's a place where editors uh, of all the major journals, I think we have about 50, 55 editors at the moment, are regularly contributing uh, with their opinions and some of the things they, 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 uh, um, they're worried about as their, their own submissions come in. Uh, language teaching, as I'll show you now, is a journal which is very unlike any other journal and always has been, um, because what we publish are research, critical research reviews, shall we say, to use a more general uh, term for it. Um, basically, you'll be very hard put to find anything else, uh, another journal with this kind of, uh, uh, of, of strands or series that we call them. And I'll introduce them now to you, hopefully through the, the screen.
Dr. Port, I'm afraid that we cannot hear the audio from the video that you've, you've created. Um, would it be possible for you to briefly summarize um, what it yeah. is that, thank you. Okay, I will. Okay, I will, uh, can you hear me now? Is that okay? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I'll go through what we, uh, the, um, the slide that you can see at the moment on the screen, all right? Can you see that slide okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, the state of the art articles are the uh, our normal bread and butter uh, review, critical review articles. Um, they are long established in a sense that they, you can find those in other journals, they are uh, reviews of up to 100 pieces of, uh, of literature, books and uh, articles that have been published over the last 15, 20 years in a specific area. Most of these are, um, like much of our work in the journal, are commissioned pieces. In other words, authors come uh, write to me and they say that uh, they would like to do a particular uh, review of this. Can, uh, is it possible to do it? And then we talk about it. And that's how that state of the art article uh, begins. Um, the research timeline, again, is, is unique to language teaching. It is what you see there, a, a graphic presentation of the key research, and it looks historically at a particular area of second language acquisition and applied linguistics, in fact, uh, with a set of representative bibliographical references and uh, short uh, reference uh, abstracts of that, of that uh, work. And the person who writes that research timeline will be asked to uh, try to associate and show the reader how research, uh, previous research, feeds in to uh, current research and how it might uh, be taken up by future researchers as well. The plenary speeches are exactly what you see there. Um, we uh, accept or we invite and we accept uh, written up speeches from some of the major conferences that, uh, that take place around the world and usually publish two or three of those every issue and we have four issues a year. Uh, another strand that we have, again unique to uh, language teaching, looks at specific uh, research in second languages. So, for example, uh, L2 Spanish, uh, L2 uh, German, L2 French, and coming up uh, we have one on L2 Chinese, uh, and looks at that research again from a critical angle, uh, the same as a country in focus, which is again what you see there, where we ask a, a, usually a team of authors to um, talk about um, uh, the research that has been published usually within uh, a country. So we're looking particularly at national journals, national conferences, uh, with a view to trying to promote the research that's being done in a particular country and which perhaps doesn't get to the uh, eyes and ears of international readers through uh, the bigger international journals. Uh, research agendas, again, a unique strand of uh, language teaching. Um, where we um, ask authors to um, present a number of tasks, uh, a research agenda, literally for the next 10 to 15 years, that they see uh, work that needs to be done and that's particularly useful uh, for the future. And during that research task, uh, research agenda, they'll be asked to present about uh, 12 different tasks. Uh, defending why those need to be done and why they're important for the field and also um, uh, showing the readers how to actually go about it and, and why it would be useful for an eventual publication. <clears throat> research in progress. Uh, research in progress is uh, short reports uh, about uh, current work being carried out by research groups in universities internationally and or rep reports from uh, symposia. Uh, we also now, um, and I'll talk about this in a minute with the next slide, uh, we also now publish uh, poster presentations from the big international conferences. Um, we ask you for a, a short summary of your poster and the poster, the colour poster itself, is posted online uh, with a link to it. Uh, replication studies, uh, you've heard today, is the big uh, hot topic area, I suppose. Um, I talked about this many, many years ago, and as uh, Emma says, uh, calls have been going out from journals for many, many years. I've written two books, uh, latest one with, with Kevin McManus, on how to do replication studies. All I can emphasize here is we badly need those studies. Uh, we do publish them here, but one of the unique features, excuse me, one of the new features of replication studies strand in 
language teaching is that we also ask authors to suggest two or three studies that in their opinion need to be replicated. Uh, and that's a very important thing because many uh, authors, many researchers don't know what needs to be replicated at the moment. And this is very important for them to, uh, to see somebody suggesting that this is what needs to be replicated, this is how it can be done, and uh, this is one of the advantages in terms of publication of carrying it out. And finally, our last critical survey, which we have um, usually one a year, of the uh, a critical review of a PhD and uh, EDD thesis, doctoral thesis. Uh, I've just this minute received one uh, for uh, the USA covering the last uh, 10 years, um, whereby again, uh, authors are asked to select what they feel are the most significant doctoral thesis that have been read over the last, uh, last few years. I'll move on to the next slide. Can you see that one, Joe? I'll take that as a yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, I'll go through these um, uh, things that you see. There. Excuse my open mouth there on the still. It isn't open anymore. Um, on the right-hand side, uh, some, some do's and some don'ts that I wanted to, uh, to tell you about. First of all, um, uh, every author understands that there are demands on researchers from local and national uh, authorities to publish. And not only to do that, but to publish in reputable journals. Uh, in many countries, we know that that's a requirement before a PhD is, uh, is awarded. And that obligation is very often glossed by the need, as Emma was saying, for journals to be indexed in internationally recognized, although very highly questioned, indexes such as the Citation Index. That, it seems to me, and it seems to people that have, uh, to the editors that I talk to on the, uh, on the forum, very often leads to, to panic and desperation. And panic very often means I, I need to get this published very, very quickly. Now, editors are very much aware of the pressure to publish. I'm sure you all know that uh, journals take a long time, although it's getting a bit better now online, to actually get your work into print or uh, even online sometimes. So a few pieces of advice here about some of which have been talked about today, but I, again, make no apologies for repeating them. Uh, at the top, do your journal research as carefully as your academic research. Uh, by that, um, going back to what Marta was talking about at the beginning, it is it's not good practice to blanket submit. By that we mean uh, to just send out your work to every single journal whose uh, email ed ed editor you can, fi you can find. Um, <coughs> you can you've carefully prepared, you've carefully executed, and you've written up your study. Uh, it's not good form to send that study to all the applied linguistics or to all the second language acquisition journals that are out there. Um, apart from being against the agreement that you usually sign with a journal when you would submit to something like Scholar One, many journals use the same reviewers, and it can easily get about when the same reviewer sees the same or a very similar paper across different journals and sometimes this comes out should we say uh, albeit confidentially in a in a, a forum like the, the editors when they're sharing their their opinions about what's happening um, going down it firstly set aside some time about where your paper might achieve the greatest impact as regards the readers and that is uh, both academically in terms of the reader impact uh, what, what kind of a reader usually reads that journal and also geographically find out where most of the readers live um, it should be available on the web page if not write to the editor and find out where most of their readers or their subscriptions appear to be going it's a very important part of a journal where does it where is it read and by whom um, Second, uh, going down a bit further, uh, the, the editors expected you, therefore, to have targeted their journal for a reason. So this is obvious, but learn about the, the topics that are in, of interest to that journal's readership and ask yourself if your proposed research or your completed study is likely to fit in with that agenda. Now, unlike many years ago, there are now more and more what we call niche uh, journals or, or, or special interest journals in our field. The journal of, of, of uh, pronunciation is, is one that's come up recently and uh, uh, journal of academic 
research writing very much niche topics but it's very very they're very very welcome because they they begin to give you a, a chance to direct your research at a, a, at a much more suitable journal than perhaps a, a generalist one um, Therefore, do read the typical content in, in, in all of these journals and as well as the, the, the section in the submission guidelines, which I find in my case in, in language teaching, for example, very few sub, uh, people who submit to the journal appear to have read uh, the guidelines. And um, if you ever submit to language teaching, for example, you are now forced to, to, to uh, um, uh, suggest to me directly why you think your paper particularly fits in with this particular section in the journal to make sure that you actually have been reading the journal. Um, talking about uh, um, COVID and just a, a, as an aside here, um, because of the problems of, of uh, publication um, and uh, particularly the problems of, of conferences and conferences being cancelled and uh, research meetings having to be cancelled, um, there are new opportunities that are beginning to, to, to be seen um, for places where you can uh, begin to pre-publish your work um, and you can disseminate your work at a pre-publication stage. For example, um, pre-print platforms. I think there actually is a, a, a site now called preprint.com. Um, uh, there are ways where you can get your, your uh, research out there. Um, at an earlier stage without committing yourself to the whole uh, paper where you could publish the paper later on, for example, in another journal. We, for example, uh, in language teaching, uh, publish reports from uh, established research groups about work that they're currently undertaking that have yet to publish. Uh, and as I said, we, we have now um, uh, are po are, are publishing selected poster presentations from conferences, including uh, those uh, from Denver that didn't actually make it, but now will make it, uh, to, at least to print. Uh, we are printing and uh, presenting a few of those over the next few issues together with their, um, their poster itself now. Um, move on to this last slide. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, um, a final big do from me. Um, think about how people might sit up and take more notice of your work. Um, yes, there are many journals now that are specialist journals that are niche journals, and doubtless you will more easily find an outlet for your work than some years ago. And yes, you will soon be able to see what are the hot topics for research and publication, but that'll be currently. They may not be the hot topics in a couple of years down the road when you might have finished your work and you're ready for publication. So I thought I'd pick something up that, that Marta said right at the beginning of, uh, of, the, of the webinar today. Um, and I would quote, for example, uh, here from Robert Frost's um, poem, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. Um, to put it in applied linguistics terms, um, find something new. Huh? Um, if you review uh, a particular journal uh, and uh, reading up on that journal, you notice that the current on-trend topic as it appears to be at the moment is, is bilingualism or multilingualism. Look a bit deeper into the journal that you've been reading. Maybe a lot of those studies tend to focus, as they do it seems to me, on two languages in particular, particularly English and Spanish. Maybe, maybe we have too much research on how Spanish and English bilinguals perform. Maybe we have nothing from lesser known languages and how they interact. Um, maybe we have a lot of research on bilinguals themselves, but bilinguals who are easy to source, such as uh, school bilinguals or college students, but much less on old bilinguals, or even much older ones like me, in fact. Um, I'm asking you to now and again, go down a different road, look at a familiar object from a, a different angle. And that presents us with potentially very useful results for the literature. But it also makes me 
want to read your work to discover why you decided to take that unusual route. Uh, about um, too many years ago, uh, when I was, uh, I think about 22, 23, I published a, a, an article in the English Language Teaching Journal. It was part of my master's uh, degree. Uh, and at the time, language learning strategies was all the rage. It was the hot topic. It was too hot a topic, really. Um, and it didn't lead to much uh, useful uh, work in the in the classroom perhaps but it was uh, a very hot topic and I went to my um, uh, tutor for the masters and I said you know there's lots on the good language learner all I can read about is the good language learner would you mind if I did a piece on the poor language learner and he said why would you study them and I said well I'd like to know what strategies they use or they don't use um, and I'm pleased to say that I, I followed that that uh, way of thinking uh, um, all the way down the line that I try to find a different angle to look at, at something which is there and I would encourage you to to do that. Finally a very big repeated blanket uh, uh, um, criticism of blanket sending. Please understand that editors are uh, able to contact each other and uh, very often multiple submissions of the same or, or very similar papers uh, come up in discussion because reviewers who are part of that board maybe have noticed uh, that the same paper is coming up at the same time, maybe with a few words that are, are different. Um, recently, uh, a paper was discovered to have been sent to six different journals simultaneously, only because of the fact that the reviewer uh, had been the same reviewer across those journals. Um, uh, just to bear in mind that, that when you submit to, uh, to Scholar One, you usually be ticking a box uh, uh, where you're making a legal declaration that you have not submitted that paper to other journals. Um, be very careful because it could only lead to a rejection from all of those journals and obviously a waste of your time. Uh, and finally, something that I was asked to bring up from the Editors Forum, uh, it, it has been seen uh, recently that in some countries, there are certain people called agents, apparently, who, uh, for a fee, obviously, uh, appear to take charge of submitting your paper to a journal um, and then basically tell you what happens to it. Um, what's happening, or what we've noticed has happened in some cases, is that these agents are submitting to large numbers of journals simultaneously without the original author knowing but you as the original author taking all the uh, the consequences so i would be again very wary of that and very careful um finally at uh, the bottom of that slide i hope you can see uh, is a link to the journal and a, uh, a reading pack where you can see uh, free uh, some samples of those strands that i've mentioned and the kind of thing uh, that we've published okay i'll stop there Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Port, and thank you to our audience for um, listening to uh, these valuable insights and contributions from our panelists. We're now at 2.05 p.m., which means that technically our webinar is over. I would like to invite you, however, to stay for a few additional minutes because I figured without having one question at least posed to our panelists, we can't really consider it a complete event. And so in that um, light, I'm going to, to ask a question that's directed to to all of uh, the um, editors who have joined us today um, and it, it stems really from a comment that um, Dr. Anton made about welcoming new avenues of research. It seems to me that when we're pursuing new avenues of research, there's a little bit of tension in that there is also conversations that are currently taking place in your various journals. And so how is it that when we're pursuing new avenues of research, how do we join in conversation with existing avenues of research? And I'll just, as you guys can tackle that in the order that you, you, you can self-nominate, is what I'd like to say. I think I would say, uh, going back to something that uh, Emma mentioned, that um, what you're creating is part of a larger conversation. 
And uh, it's up to you to explain how what you do relates to a particular theoretical framework or a particular conversation going on in the field, not necessarily in the journal, although as Emma mentioned, um, familiarity with the journal is important and uh, uh, realizing whether that particular conversation is important for that journal. So when I say new avenues of research, I'm talking about advancing, maybe exploring from a different perspective, like uh, Graham mentioned, but always linking to what exists already and explaining why is it that you are really advancing the field, you know, whatever the mission of the journal is. Absolutely, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Port or Dr. Marsden, would you like to contribute? I'll go in very quickly, just a, 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 with a, a, a short, reference here yeah i mean the importance here is that you read around your journals uh you do need to be to, to know what's going on uh in a number of the generalist journals obviously uh you need to be aware and you need to be able to uh, refer to that research um looking at things from a, a a different angle also you need to be careful because maybe somebody else has looked at that uh, a particular angle but there, there is always a different way of looking at something. And uh, whatever any uh, current topics uh, are being handled by the different journals, uh, I would just, to a certain extent, my own part, encourage you to be perverse, if we say, and look at it from a different way. There is always a different way of looking at, at things. Um, and uh, you can see by the popularity of, of, of replications at the moment, replications have only suddenly uh, become noticed really by uh, applied linguistics researchers, but they've been the norm for pure science researchers for many years because they have to look at a particular study in different ways before it's even uh, decided that it's, uh, it's worth publishing. Emma? Yeah, um, I, I agree. whoever asked that question, that's a great question. I think there is a tension, and it's particularly a worrying tension when you're at the start of the publishing of your publishing life. This tension between getting something new enough that a journal is going to want to publish, and yet fitting into an existing conversation. And um, two great answers have been given already, so I'll just add a, a few other things. I would encourage you to look on early view. So now we get things online. All journals get things online early. So. Uh, before it goes into print, before it goes into an issue. And that's one way of checking that you're really up to speed with the most recent developments. Um, another one is uh, email authors. You know, usually researchers are really flattered to get interest fr from their... Um, uh, from their... My screen is frozen, actually. I'm a bit worried you can't hear me. Joe, can everyone hear me? I, I can hear you just fine. Oh, good, 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 okay. Um, yeah, get, get, so feel free to email researchers and say, um, you know, I'm aware that you were working on this. I saw you in a conference program a few years ago, a year or so ago. Have you published anything on it yet? Look on their websites. They often hold preprints there. And as Graham was talking about, there are now preprint repositories. Um, so that's a way of sort of making sure that you're, you're, you, that you that, that you're breaking into a conversation, but then adding something new because you're really looking at the most recent work. Another one is even with replication, um, you do need, when you're publishing a replication, you need to justify really clearly how that fits into an ongoing conversation or why it's important to do a replication of that, that piece. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think everything else has, that's been said has, has been very valid. Okay. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and contributing their, their time and their expertise and their insights. Um, I hope that our audience members will be able to benefit from this information and will be considering how they too can get um, their, their, their research published. Um, thank you everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.